Hey, what's up everyone? Danny here. This is the most recent gaming PC I've built, and while not perfect, I'm pretty happy with how it came out for a number of reasons. First off, we have this awesome short and wide case, which if you know me at all, the closer a case is to a cube shape, the more I love it. So this one gets a lot of love from me. This was also my first time building with a 12th gen Intel processor, so that was pretty exciting because this was a very big generation for Intel, and I definitely look forward to building with them more, especially with their like lower end to mid-range offerings. This build was actually sponsored by Micro Center, so huge thanks to them for their support. As you all know by now, if you're lucky enough to have a Micro Center local to you, it is hands down the best place to go for all your PC tech needs. Whether it be components for your next gaming PC, pre-built systems, laptops, peripherals, you name it. Micro Center is your one-stop shop with a great selection of products to choose from, unbeatable low prices, and top-notch customer service. I'll have links for all the parts or alternatives down below in the description. I know not everyone has a Micro Center nearby, but this build should be relatively easy to replicate using parts from other retailers as well while still achieving the same performance and price. And with that said, let's get into the parts. Starting off with the processor, we have the i5-12400. This is one of the best price to performance processors available at the moment, coming in at around $200 for most retailers. If you can grab it from Micro Center, then they've got it for a crazy good deal at $169. Nice. With an additional $20 off when bundled with the motherboard, making this deal even sweeter. This is a 6 core 12 thread processor, all of which are performance cores. There's no efficiency cores here as those are reserved for Intel's higher end offerings starting with the 12600K. But even so, performance from the 12400 6 performance cores is more than enough for gaming, streaming, and even content creation all at a very affordable price. You can also go with the i5-12400F to save a bit of money if you're planning on building with a graphics card and don't need integrated graphics. Those are usually $20 to $30 cheaper if you can find them. With this new generation of processors comes a brand new redesigned stock cooler, the first time Intel has made major updates to the design in a really, really long time. The new design features a copper slug, which is something that Intel has included and then removed from their coolers in the past, so it's nice to see here. However, this still utilizes a pushpin design, which I'm not so much of a fan of. Aesthetically, I find this new flared out plastic shroud design a bit odd looking. I much prefer a clean sleek look like what AMD did when they had their stock cooler update, but I'll take this over the old design any day of the week. For this build, I decided to use the stock cooler even though it seems like an odd pairing considering the overall cost of the build. It's not that I couldn't fit a different cooler into the budget because there are plenty of great options for around $30 or so that I could have gone with. I just really wanted to use this being as it's my first time ever seeing one of these in person and I actually wanted to see if it was viable or not. And you're gonna see later on in the video uh, whether or not that was a good idea. Paired with the 12400 is the ASUS Prime B660 Plus D4 motherboard. This board comes in at $140, which to me is a bit expensive relative to how much the 12400 costs, but this is the double-edged sword with low to mid-range 12th gen Intel builds at the moment. While the i3 and i5 processors are priced really well, the motherboards, not so much. Even the most entry-level H610 boards are already priced around $100, but those are very basic, lacking any cooling for the VRMs, have no USB-C connectivity, and doesn't even have PCIe Gen 4 support. The B660 boards, on the other hand, usually have all of that, so while they're a bit pricier, you're getting more features, and it does set the system up for a down-the-road upgrade to a higher-end processor. For the graphics card, we've got the ASUS Dual RTX 3070 LHR. Alleviation for the graphics card market seems to be well underway now, with cards consistently being found in stock at prices that are decreasing by the day. Not too long ago, we were seeing RTX 3070s out of stock from retailers everywhere and only available for well over $1,000 on websites like eBay and OfferUp. But now they're actually staying in stock, albeit at prices that are still a bit high compared to the MSRP. Things are trending in a good direction though, with some retailers having much more reasonable prices than others, but of course, the more reasonable it is, the more likely they'll be sold out. But we're getting there. The market seems to be healing, so hopefully all of you who have held out on building your systems haven't spent the money elsewhere by now. Pairing the 3070, which costs more than triple the 12400, may seem like an odd pairing at first glance, but I can assure you the 12400 handles it just fine and there are no major bottleneck issues here. For memory, I went with 32GB of Crucial Ballistics DDR4 at 3200MHz CL16. 
I was going for a sleek and stealth black aesthetic for this build, so I forgoed on the RGB. If you find yourself being budget constrained for the overall cost of the build for whatever reason, this is one area you can be flexible and grab less RAM. 16 gigabytes will be plenty for most people out there, and you can always grab more later. I'm using a one terabyte inland performance M.2 NVMe SSD for storage. This is a PCIe Gen 4 drive with great read and write speeds, and although most people won't realize the gains between this and a Gen 3 drive at the moment, we're starting to see Gen 4 drives converge in price within 10% or so of Gen 3 drives, which in that case, if your system is Gen 4 compatible, you might as well grab it now as it'll help with drive to drive transfers in the future as you add more SSDs to the system. This drive comes with a heatsink to help with the cooling, but I removed it since the motherboard already has a heatsink included. For the power supply, we've got the Corsair CX650M. I actually intended to go with the old circular grill version that I've used many times in the past, but accidentally chose this because they confusingly have the same name, with this being the 2021 revision with an updated fan and grill pattern. One thing to note about this version though is that Corsair decided to change how many modular cables they include. The old version used to have two separate PCIe Y cables, but this newer version only comes with a single one, so I was forced to daisy chain to power the graphics card. I know some people get really concerned when it comes to using two connectors from the same cable, but I'm not really worried about it for this build because the RTX 3070 is a 220-ish watt card, uh, plus or minus some depending on the specific model, and considering that the motherboard provides up to 75 watts of power, I'm not really worried about the remainder coming through the cable. Last but not least, we have the case, the Lian Li O11 Air Mini. The O11 line of cases have been met with overwhelmingly positive feedback from the tech community, but for some reason, I've completely slept on them for the longest time, having never built in any of the variations until now. This case is by no means cheap, coming in at around $130, but for that price, you're getting a feature-filled, well-built premium case that completely justifies the price tag. Everything about this case is thought out and intentional, which is no surprise being that it's a collaboration between Lee and Lee and renowned extreme overclocker DeBauer. Building this case is a breeze due to its modularity. You can remove the top panel to really open it up and have more space to work in, and the dual chamber design gives plenty of room for cable management in the back, which all stays hidden behind the sleek looking cable bar and 2.5 inch SSD mount. Cooling is great with the three included fans, two of which are 140 millimeters in the front and one 120 millimeters in the back. There's plenty of ventilation all around with support with a number of fan and radiator configurations at the top, front, and bottom. One important thing to note though is that while the name of this case has the word mini in it, this is not an ITX case. It supports standard ATX motherboards and power supplies. So for those out there who dread paying the premium for ITX motherboards and SFX power supplies, you won't have that here. Taking a look at the parts list and price summary, all this comes in under $1,500 if we're going by micro center prices. Now, as I mentioned earlier on in the video, this should be achievable even if you had to get parts elsewhere. So if we look at the worst case scenario, say you don't have a micro center nearby, so you don't get the cheap 12400 and that combo deal, and you have to spend a bit more for the graphics card, say up to $750, we're still at around $1,500. A little bit over it, but as always, you can adjust the parts to bring it down a little. The case in the motherboard are areas where you can swap out for lower cost parts, and you can also drop down to 16 gigabytes of RAM like I mentioned earlier, and performance won't change much. As always, being flexible is key. Before we get into the performance, let's take a look at how this all came together. Here are some glamour shots of the completed build. As you can see, I was going for a sleek and simple stealth black look, but that was kind of ruined by the Intel stock cooler's bright blue ring, which I couldn't find a quick and easy way to remove. There's also the LEDs on the 3070, which surprisingly is not RGB, which I find bizarre in this day and age, especially for a product at this price. So it's not controllable, nor can it be turned off. So there's a bit of clashing there with the accent colors, which I'll fix eventually. But otherwise, I really like how it came out overall, and it's nice to change it up once in a while and do an RGB-less build. All right, time for the benchmarks. Aside from running the memory at the 3200 MHz XMP, everything else was run at stock settings. So the 12400 and 3070 will be boosting automatically with their respective boost technologies. Resizable bar is enabled because we do have support for it, and the games were tested at both 1080p and 1440p as those are the fitting resolutions for the specs. Uh, but yeah, sit back, relax, and enjoy the benchmarks.
So there you have it. The system performs well and handled everything that was thrown at it with no issues, which shouldn't really be a surprise given that it's equipped with current gen parts. As you may have noticed from the benchmarks though, the Intel stock cooler did have the CPU running a bit toasty, operating above 70 degrees a lot of the times, and sometimes getting close to 80 depending on the title. That's probably a lot higher than most people out there would like to operate at, but it's still quite a ways from the thermal limit. And even under extended heavy workloads like Blender, uh, Cinebench, and streaming a heavy title, it never throttled as the temps never went above the low 80s. And for reference, the room ambient temperature when I was testing was 22 degrees Celsius. The fan does get pretty loud though under extended workloads, pretty much running at the max speed of 3100 RPMs. So while the cooler technically works, it would definitely be a good idea to grab an aftermarket cooler for better thermals and acoustics, which I will be putting a better one in this system soon after this video goes live. With the outlook of the graphics card market looking a lot better now, I feel like more people will be enthusiastic about PC builds again. I really hope it keeps trending this way and doesn't relapse for whatever reason. Uh, let me know down in the comments below if you have been able to finish off a build recently due to the market recovering. I'd love to hear what you're able to end up with after patiently waiting all this time. Uh, but yeah, with that said, that's going to wrap it up for this video though. Hope you all enjoyed and found this either useful or entertaining in one way or another. I want to thank you all as always for watching and for continuing to support the channel. And of course, I got to give a big shout out to the channel members for their above and beyond support. Uh, but yeah, other than that, be safe out there and I will see you down in the comments as well as in the next video and or stream. Bye.